Welcome back to Book View Now here at the Miami Book Fair. I'm Jeffrey Brown. I'm joined now by Art Spiegelman to talk about a book that he has edited, right? Edited, Called designed, edited and, designed. Uh, kind of did an introduction for and got engaged by for the last year or more. And it's called Cy Lewin's Parade, An Artist Journey. So what, tell me what this is. How do you describe this? Well, it's an unusual project. It certainly is. It's a uh, part of a genre of books that got popular after World War I, which was wordless stories. In other words, stories told strictly in pictures. It was started by an artist named Franz Masriel in Belgium, and it inspired a wave of these books. I thought they'd been pretty much that first wave completed by 1938 or so, because they have a feeling about the Depression and communism and socialism. They have a political aspect. Mm -hmm. They have a kind of melodramatic quality. And then there's a book that I found very obscure in a very obscure genre uh, that blew me away. It was uh, much more universal than the others, and it seemed to like be deeply fraught with emotion. And I wanted to include it in a presentation I was making of these things. So yeah. I call up a place I found on the web called the Cy Lewin Museum and explained I wanted to use this in a stage presentation. Could they tell me how to get the rights? I said, you'll have to talk to Cy Lewin, yeah. which blew me away because he, he, he was know, he alive. Looked, I'd seen a photograph of him, but he looked like he was uh, um, 30 years old back in uh, 1948 or so, and I didn't think he would still be there, let alone vital and still working. And you met him, though, but at this point he was 94 He was 93 or, so. or 4 when yeah. I first met him. And, but, but tell me, tell us a little bit what about him, his background. Oh, his background. Yeah. Okay, born literally a day before Armistice Day, after World War I, a Polish Jew. Uh, uh, his family was kind of... Uh, illustrious in a certain way. His mother was the granddaughter of the wonder rabbi of Lublin, and his father was, sounds like an oxymoron, uh, a famous Yiddish writer. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, and after World War I, because of the anti-Jewish sentiment that was beginning to gather in Poland, they fled for safety to Berlin, uh, for which safety. at the time seemed like a good idea. Yeah. Right, right. Um, so he grew up sorry, in Germany, feeling very picked upon as the Polish uh, kike in the school and ostracized, very alienated, but falling in love with picture making from mm -hmm. the age of six or so and was quite, quite prodigious and serious about making images. And then happily was living in this world of becoming a painter, isolated from a lot of his friends because there weren't any there. Uh, and then when Hitler came to power, he said, we got to get out of here. Mm -hmm. And his father who had even written a book about the dangers of fascism said, oh, this isn't anything to worry about. And he, at the age of 14, said, I'm getting out of here. And he took his brother, and just the brother who's a year older, they fled to France, mm -hmm. where uh, he was living. And then through a fluke that might be longer than a 10-minute interview, but it's fascinating, he and the entire family were invited to come to America. Mm -hmm. um, and it's at that point he had one splendid year. He'd always felt persecuted. And here, breathing the free air of New York City, yeah. um, he was going to art classes and living in the city, going to the Metropolitan Museum every day to talk to the paintings, yeah. as he said. Uh, one year later, he was almost beaten to death by a policeman because he was a Jew uh, in Central in New Park. York. In New York. Yeah, so he hadn't escaped. He yeah. hadn't escaped. The yeah. world was uh, yeah. closing in on him, just the way I feel the world is closing in yet again. And then, in, he, after a suicide attempt created by this event, he then joined a group called the Ritchie Boys. It's a, documentary that was a finalist for Best Documentary a few years back mm -hmm. about a group of secret special ops in World War II who were fluid in German yeah. and worked for the Allies in the war. So he was there to do either translation or propaganda or whatever was needed. And he was on the front. He was on Normandy Beach uh, yeah. 10 days after they landed. He was being shot everywhere. He traveled across Germany and France. And then... Oh, he was at Buchenwald the day that it, after it was liberated. Concentration camp. Yeah, now yeah. he is, yeah, and he was then, uh, he then went in and all of a sudden he saw what would have been his destiny if not for the flukish yeah. uh, arrival in America as a refugee. Uh, yeah. And he broke down and was brought back because he was already internally bleeding and had concussions and was living on schnapps just to get through this uh, war. And in America, after he came back from six months in the VA hospital. He'd resumed painting now. And he said, yeah. but to my surprise, I'd banished black from my palette. And the paintings had a kind of 
uh, beauty to them, the kind of post-impressionist paintings yeah. that everybody can love. And he became a very successful painter. But he, his dark side returned, and the gallery said, make more of that dark stuff, of yeah. uh, that pretty stuff. Yeah. Ignore this dark side for our galleries. He couldn't do it. And well, one of the things he made from his dark side was yeah. a book called The Parade. So that's, this is 1957, right? The, the first parade, publication. Yeah. The drawings were made so in tell 48 me, but to But tell me, so pull this out here, okay. because you've now... Okay, I've set you've, a stage. You've created the parade. You, you've remade the parade. Yes. But in a whole... In a whole different way. Yeah. First of all, reshooting from the original drawings. Uh, and giving it a new format, which is called, in a box, it's a concertina book. It's a book in which each picture, as he says, talks to each other. That's what he wanted to do. Yeah. And so there's 75 images that tell an amazingly jazz-like dirge of man's perpetual desire to destroy himself. So the generational uh, grip of war fever in which eventually people get exhausted, the survivors go on with their life, and then it starts up again, a new parade toward destruction and war. But it's a, it's a, it's a dark parade. It's, it's a, a dark parade. parade. And he thought of it, he wanted to make it when he was on the front. He started working on it in the 40s. He had one big fan who saw it when it was shown in a gallery uh, by a famous woman photographer named... Uh, Lottie Jacoby, who was a portrait photographer as well as mm -hmm. an experimental photographer. One of her subjects was uh, Albert Einstein, yeah. who was an enormous fan of this project. He said, this is his closing paragraph of the letter was, the world needs you and your art. Yeah. And it doesn't take a genius after looking through this to know it's absolutely true. This is as relevant now as it was then. This was Sai back when he was making the book in mm -hmm. about 1950. Mm -hmm. And this thing is... Uh, influenced and versions of the modernist painters that surrounded him. Yeah. Little, you look and you go, oh, that looks like Picasso. Oh, yeah. that over there that looks but, like But, you know, you mentioned whoever. names like that, and then I wonder if you, you, you discovered him by accident. Yeah. No one's heard of him, right? Mostly For the most, not. most of they us. They used to. He was yeah, no, they used painter. to. I know. But that's what I'm asking is sort of the, have you wondered why he was lost or why most yes, of us don't it was, know? Yes, it was... Uh, a conscious, willful act. He didn't want to make those beautiful paintings anymore. And, and finally, in his 60s, he quit it. He just said, you know, art is not a commodity. Art is priceless. And then he stopped and he says, you know, when it's priceless, it's voiceless. So at that point, he was painting more prolifically than ever yeah. and better than ever in many ways. And uh, he had turned his back on the galleries and museums, and they sort of turned their back, back on him. So he continued the rest of his life becoming more and more uh, recessively visible, you know, yeah. invisible, invisible, but made some of his best pictures then. So after discovering this book and discovering that Sai was still alive at the age of 93, and I got permission to use his work from him, where he explained, art is not a commodity, you can use it, but you can't give me any money for it. Wow. Um, so you, then, so you, you, I mean, he got to see the finished project, right? right? before he died, because yeah. I, I found out more about his life. I added what's usually on the back of these uh, accordion fold books is white paper, yeah. but there's too much to him. And so the back became his backstory. When you finish yeah. the book, you turn it over, and now you're in the story of his life and paintings from throughout his life trying to explain what yeah. his work was yeah. about. Um, so he got very excited by this. At this point, he was pretty much not painting in his last year or so. His, he had real problems with his hand and whatever. Uh, but I brought him the very first copy of this bizarre object yeah. uh, and was hoping he would like it. He knew what he, I was making but couldn't visualize it. And then he said, Art, this is a new genre. I've never <laughs> seen anything like it. I'm so curious. I want to see both sides at once. Um, and he was, wouldn't put it down. We were just, he was just looking yeah. uh, at yeah, yeah. this thing. And he felt so grateful because he wasn't making his work thinking, oh, well, I'll, be, I'll show them I'm going to become famous yeah. or something. He was making work because he's a painter. A painter paints. It's the way he breathes. Yeah. It's how he thinks. It's how he feels. And he saw this and saw that it would remain in the world. And it kind of gave him permission to die. Ten days later, he died. Now, if he kept his promise to me, I said, wait till the book comes outside. We'll do Skype interviews and yeah. you don't have to leave the rest home. We'll right. just make it work. Right. He says, I'll try, but he's very dubious, you know. I, ju I just want to ask you in our last minute, because, I mean, just yeah. listening to you describe him, but for you, this was clearly was a kind of magical thing. project. In yes, a way. and part of it was feeling I could be useful to somebody who I come to really care about, because, you know, I'm 68. At 68, it's hard to find father figures. 
Right. And although Cy was more of a screwy uncle than a father <laughs> figure, he was, uh, I, I believed in his values. He was really uh, an eccentric, beautiful, original thinker. You yeah. know, When I asked him about the election, because he just died a few months ago now, I said, so are you for Bernie or are you for Hillary? I said, Hillary, of course. Really, you described yourself as being to the left of Karl Marx. How could you vote for Hillary in this election? So, Bernie Sanders seems like a smart man, but Art, if we're going to survive into the future, we have to become a matriarchy. And that's the last picture in the parade, which mm -hmm. is a mother hugging her son who survived the war, you know? Yeah. And that was okay. basically what, uh, let me just get whatever bit of it glances there. We have to become a matriarchy to survive. And that was kind of touching. He believed it. All right. The book is Cy Lewin's Parade, An, Artist, An Artist's Journey. Art Spiegelman. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Jeffrey.